Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of Watts Collection. Uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about something very specific and that's the mainspring of mechanical watches. All mechanical watches have some kind of power provided by one or more mainsprings. Uh, I'm wearing my um, H. Moser at C Henry double hair spring. I always have trouble with that one. Okay, the double hair spring is a hair spring, not a mainspring. It's got a big mainspring in there running everything else, like like all the other watches. Okay, uh, there's a picture of a of a mainspring, and it's uh, it's simply a very long rectangular shaped piece of metal, and the kind of metal that is used is it has all kinds of incredibly important features to it. Uh, one of them being anti-magnetic, one that they don't break, one that they don't change the the amount of tension, and so you have these all of these combinations of metals together to make a good hairspring. And you know, modern hairsprings they're, they're very reliable. All right, so. All right, so what do we do with this? Here you have the S shape, and the S shape helps to uh, keep the constant, uh, keep the force from the from the mainspring uh, constant. All right, uh, let's let's take a look at essentially the whole concept of tension uh, of resuming shape. the The shape of a hairspring, or not a hairspring, but a mainspring. Is whatever the uncoiled version of it is and it's trying to get back to that shape now the same thing is true with a bow and arrow uh, when you pull a string back on a bow string doesn't change a bit uh, it's the shape of the bow and it becomes tense and when you release the arrow the string is forced back to its original position by the bow retaining its uh, original shape. All right, that's, that's pretty much the same way that all uh, springs work. Now, there's, uh, the other one I have is uh, from a catapult. And the way the, uh, this particular catapult worked is that they would wind it up and, and they would have these, and it would have an arm within the, uh, the wound rope and they would crank it up and then release it and whoosh, all at once, and it would shoot out some projectile. All right, now uh, those are the same thing. We're, we're dealing with the same notion of tension. The big difference is this, is that with our watches, they have to be done slowly, all right? With a bow, whoosh, it done, same thing with a catapult, um, but not a watch. Oh, if we did that with a watch and it, boom, uh, it was gone. I mean, it, we, we, we couldn't use it to tell time. And so it has to be done very slowly. All right. Uh, so let's take a look at, at what's going on with this. Now, you have a, when you, when you wind up your watch, uh, this is my harboring too. When you wind up your watch, what essentially you're, you're doing is that you're turning a wheel, it's called a winding wheel or a winding gear. And uh, that's turned by when you turn the, the crown, okay? And the crown has a, it's, it's attached to a shaft that goes down with a, um, <clears throat> a pinion gear on it that turns the uh, winding wheel and then the winding wheel, uh, it turns a wheel that contains a spring and what this does, it increases the tension on the spring. Now, this modern watches go into something called the going barrel. And within the going barrel, there's a picture of it there uh, in the upper left. You, you can see inside of that, you have the spring that's attached to the middle of the, of the barrel in a thing called an arbor. And then on the outside, there's what's called a pin joint. And the pin joint attaches to the side of the barrel. And what happens 
is that when you wind it up, it slowly turns as it's releasing the energy from the from the spring. That's how all of our watches work. All of the mechanical watches work. Uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, I, I found a, a Rolex barrel that was on a barrel bridge. I thought that was really interesting. They have a they have their own bridge for the barrel, and um, I think I saw there was another one. They also had the winding wheel on, and the and the barrel on this uh, on what's called the barrel bridge uh, within a Rolex. Okay, um, so that's essentially uh, what we're dealing with now. There, there are lots of variations, okay? I, I brought a couple of variations. This is my FP Jorn uh, Chronomet Souverain, and there are one, two barrels. And what these two barrels are, there are different reasons for using multiple barrels. Uh, one reason is to have more and longer lasting power, and so you can wind it up and you wind up both barrels, and then it uses... Uh, the spring tension from each one and in such a way that it lasts like a week or it lasts longer. Uh, in this particular FP Jorn, that's not what's going on. They had a, a what Jorn is using, he's using 60% of each barrel. And so he cuts off the, uh, the tension as it unwinds from very powerful at the beginning to very weak at the end. Now, th this is, there's, the, the physics of it has that in it. Uh, so, the, the amount of difference between the accuracy of just using the, the, the middle part of the spring uh, is, is one way to, uh, to deal with that. And adding a second barrel simply allows you to have what would be a normal amount of time because you're only using 60% of it instead of 100%. An another one, this is another strange double barrel. You can see at the top up here, right in the middle, is the winding wheel, and then it winds two barrels. Now, these two barrels simply wind <laughs> the two watches that are inside that are synchronized using uh, resonance. So uh, there, are, there are a lot of different variations. Take a look at your watch and, and look at the winding wheel and look at the, um, uh, look at the barrel. And some, some are pretty big, others aren't too big. Uh, on my, um, I have a seven day wind on my uh, Bovey 1930. Unfortunately, it's covered up by the, uh, the base plate. And that's, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Okay, so now you got this spin, you have it all wound up, and here is what happens. The, the going barrel with the mainspring is starting to turn right, very slowly, and then it goes through a gear chain, and the gears, I think, are one, two, three, four, something like that, and then it gets to an escape wheel, and the power goes to the escape wheel. Now, the escape wheel has to deal with a locking and unlocking uh, device called a pallet fork. And the pallet fork, what happens is that the, the turning of the escape wheel kicks the uh, pallet fork, which in turn oscillates um, or <laughs> kicks the, the, um, the balance wheel, which is controlled by a hairspring. Okay. Now all of the all of this has to go on, and then it goes and it turns the hands. All of this is just powered by that single mainspring. Okay, so this is what's so to me is what's so incredible about it. All right, let's take a closer look at the uh, at what goes on in the escape in the escapement. Uh, there's something that's called the Breguet overcoil. The other day, I I somehow I think I mentioned it. Uh, with the uh, mainspring. It's, it's got nothing to do with the mainspring. It, if I, I missed up my words, I think. Uh, the Breguet overcoil is a way of, of getting a standardizing, I'll say, the hairspring. In other words, it'll, it'll give it a, a, a steady amount of oscillation. You have, I think it's, I think the way it works, you have this you have the pallet fork kicking back and forth, which is 
swinging the balance wheel one way and then it swung back by the hair spring and then it kicks it the other way and it throws it the other way and the balance and the uh, hairspring keeps the oscillation at a certain rate. Now the, the, the most common rate is called is uh, 4 hertz, okay, which is 28,800 vibrations per hour. Okay? And then they have, they have lower ones. This one has only uh, 2.5 hertz, I believe, which is, I think it's 1,800 uh, vibrations per hour. I want to talk about that at another time, but right now, what I want to point out is that the power comes through the uh, gear chain that goes to the escape wheel is all is all powered by that single main hairspring or perhaps a double hairspring in in in, uh, in some of them. Okay, uh, and so here we have this is another view of it. You can see how the uh, the pallet wheel has it. It's just that little thing in between that the uh, um, uh, the pallet arm is kicking one way and then kicking another way by the release of what's called I think it's called a, a Swiss lever uh, mechanism that they have set up between the escape wheel and the pallet fork, and that's this is this is what keeps our watches ticking. <laughs> okay, going back and forth. Uh, tick tock, tick tock, and that that's that's it. Why is this interesting, and why is this important? Well, if, I mean, it, right now, if you want to keep really accurate time, you can go out and get a quartz watch or, or a smart watch. Uh, I got my Fitbit on. This is a type of smart watch, and it'll it'll give me all kinds of information, including the time. And um, okay, that's fine. <laughs> and I recharge it every night, and it works. It works great. But mechanical watches have there's to me it's 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 almost magic because of this. Is that look at all the things you have to get just right. You have to get all of these things right so that it works accurately. And here you you can have a. a a quartz or a digital, some kind of thing. You can have them. You can have them coordinated by an atomic clock if you want, which will give you even more accuracy. But what I'd like to do just today is that sort of to bring to the fore the whole issue or the whole nature of how interesting it is that this single attention from just this mainspring makes the whole thing work. Here we're paying sometimes tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars for this little device that is working on this spring that's, you know, it's just a little little bitty spring <laughs> that you have. Okay, um, well, uh, th that was what I wanted to do today. I just, uh, I, I had talked about it the other day on our, uh, on our uh, streaming video. Uh, but today I just said, okay, let's. I just want to clarify the mainspring. I, I'd like to go into some of the other issues with the oscillation and the hairspring in another time. But today I just wanted to have something on the mainspring. And as usual, I would really like to hear from you. Take a look at your watch. See what you can find out about the hairspring, uh, the mainspring in your watch. What what kind of metal do they use? Uh, do they use silicon? So look, some some. Well, I don't know if they're using silicon in the mainspring. They may be. I know they're using them in hairspring. We'll talk about hairsprings at another time. Okay, uh, so like I said, I always like to hear from you. And of course, this is an invitation to subscribe if you like. And uh, until next time, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Art Sci, the art and science of watch collections.